Uh, I'd like to welcome both the local and the remote audiences. We're streaming this live, uh, both to the Howard Baker Center as well uh, locally. We're webcasting uh, this presentation. Um, online viewers can submit questions uh, via Facebook and Twitter if you use the uh, hashtag Vigner Lecture. We'd also like to uh, welcome Ron Woody, the mayor from Marone County, uh, also uh, this morning at the uh, Vigner Lecture Series. The Vigner Lecture Series uh, actually uh, was started uh, last November, and uh, it was organized by the Corporate Fellows. Uh, it's organized to invigorate scientific discovery, spur technological innovation, and initiate, initiate productive scientific policy debates. So it's for staff members, it's for us, to enjoy listening to these Vigner, distinguished Vigner lectures. Uh, this lecture honors uh, Eugene Wigner, who is a patron saint, one of our heroes of science uh, here at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, who was trained as a chemical engineer. He won the Nobel Prize in physics in 1963 for atomic physics, or atomic theory, and he was the founder of the field of nuclear engineering. He led the group, the theory group, at the Chicago Metallurgical Lab, and he was a role model for coupling of basic and applied work. He was the research director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It was called the Clinton Labs back then, in 1946 to 1947. Wigner's theory group at, at Chicago included such uh, Nobels or, or Nobel laureates as Alvin Weinberg and Gail Young, who followed Wigner to Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And among their acquaintances uh, was um, a Chicago mathematician named Alston Householder. Okay. In 1946, Alvin Weinberg persuaded Householder to interview for a position at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Householder came with the intention of staying for only a year or two. But in 1948, Householder became the head of a new organization, the Mathematics and Computing Panel. Okay. One of its functions was to provide a central computer pool from which computers may be drawn for individual computing jobs. Okay, now think about this. This was 1948. And in those days, computers were people. So a central computer pool of people. And they were primarily women, okay, rather than machines. Householder remained at Oak Ridge for more than 20 years. And when he retired in 1969, the lab was installing an IBM 36091, okay? It cost $6 million and was capable of doing 3 million arithmetic operations per second. 3 million adds or multiplies per second. And if you remember, you know, our computing language, that would be called a megaflop. Okay? So three megaflops. What are we at today? About 30 petaflops. Okay? This smartphone, many of you have these kinds of phones, all right? This is probably 100 times more powerful than that three megaflop computer that cost $6 million in 1969 that was that IBM 36091. We've come a long way since 1969. And thanks in part to a company that was founded just a year earlier, Intel. Intel was founded in Santa Clara in 1968 by Gordon Moore. Some of you that are computing savvy will think about Moore's Law, and yep, that's the guy, Moore's Law was founded by, or was, was determined by Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce. Craig Barrett joined the company in 1974. He rose through the ranks to become Chief Operating Officer in 1993, President in 1997, and CEO in 1998. He became Chairman of the Board in 2005 and stepped down from that position in May of 2009. Since his retirement, he has become a leading advocate for improving education in the U.S. and around the world. He, uh, he is also a vocal spokesman for the value that technology can provide in raising social and economic standards globally. Until June of 2009, Dr. Barrett served as the chairman of the United Nations Global Alliance for Information and Communication Technologies and Development. And this group works really hard to bring computers and other technology to developing parts of the world. He currently chairs Change the Equation, which is a national STEM coalition, Achieve Inc., an independent education reform organization, and DOSIA, a personal health records service. 
He co-chairs the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory Advisory Board. He has served on many other boards, policy and government panels, and advisory committees. He is a former chair of the National Academy of Engineering, to which he was elected in 1994. Last November, he received the Irish Presidential Distinguished Service Award for the Irish Abroad in recognition of his work as chairman of the Irish Technology Leadership Group. Craig Barrett is a Californian native. He received his BS, his MS, and his PhD in material science, all from Stanford. And he, and he was a faculty member at Stanford before joining Intel. His lecture topic today is economic competitiveness in the 21st century. Please help me welcome Dr. Craig Barrett. Well, good morning. It's really fun to be at uh, one of the national labs and to see the great work that goes on here. You look at me as uh, someone who is trained as an engineer and was a practicing uh, professor doing basic research at Stanford for 10 years and then joined an upstart semiconductor company and did research there for uh, seven or eight years and then migrated to the dark side into management. <laughs> and so uh, I'm not going to talk technical stuff today because you're all way smarter than I am in that topic, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about policy. And I'd like to put that policy in the following perspective. Uh, one of the great quotes that my mentor Andy Grove uh, always used to use at Intel and, and was a driving force behind Intel's success, I believe, was that only the paranoid survive. And so everything I'm going to talk to you about today is associated with paranoia about the future and about the competitiveness of the United States going forward. So uh, if I get downbeat, and, uh, you know, non-optimistic. Don't interpret that as being really uh, anti-U.S. or anti the position of the U.S. Just consider it as paranoia about what we could be if we really did things right. So I, I do want to talk about competitiveness in the 21st century. And I want to start off with basically five fundamental facts that I think you have to take into account if you want to be competitive in today's world. Uh, the first one is that competition is hard. It's tough. And I was briefly reminded of this at the early March. I flew up to Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, one of the employees at our ranch we have in Montana is a dog musher, dog racer. And she's running the Iditarod. This was her 12th year running that race. And I don't know how many of you know anything about the Iditarod dog sled race. It basically goes from Anchorage to Nome. It covers about a thousand miles and they do it in about nine days. Uh, it's an outgrowth really of what happened in the early 20th century. There was a diphtheria outbreak in Nome, Alaska. There was no serum to cure this outbreak of diphtheria. The only serum was about a thousand miles south. And there were no airplanes at the time. The ocean was frozen. There were no roads. The only way to get the serum from basically Anchorage to Nome was via dog sled. And so they organized something akin to the Pony Express. They had something like 20 different dog sledders with 20 different dog sled teams. And the first one went off for about 50 miles and handed the serum to the next sled, just like the Pony Express handed the mail. And then that one went. And they were able to get there in three or four days, 24 hours a day, 20 different teams. In the 1970s, somebody had the bright idea of resurrecting the idea of that event in the form of a formal race. Only they changed the rules slightly, which was you weren't going to have a series of teams. There would be competition between individual dog teams and mushers. And they put a few rules in place. You had to have a mandatory 24-hour rest period at one spot and two mandatory eight-hour rest periods along the way, mostly to help protect the dogs. But other than that, the dog sledder could go as hard as they want, as fast as they want, as much as they want. And it takes the individual dog sledders about eight to nine days to complete this course. They start off with 16 dogs. They have to have at least six dogs in their team to finish. 
Um, this year, interestingly, the first and second place finishers were separated by a grand total of two minutes after a thousand miles. So it was a good race. The interesting thing also is how difficult the race is. And I think it's emblematic of how difficult competition in the world today is. There is no easy way to win the Iditarod. You don't just show up and win. You train your dogs all year long. Uh, you have to be physically fit. You have to be able to withstand minus 30 degrees centigrade, 60 mile an hour winds, blinding snowstorms, follow a trail which is invisible. It's not easy, it's tough. And I think there are parallels today in the world of competition. So the first rule is competition's tough. No silver bullets, no easy way. The second rule is market shares in the world today are gained during periods of transition. And let me just give you a couple of examples, uh, talking about specific companies, specific industries, and then we'll come back and talk about countries. How many of you remember Motorola? <laughs> How many of you remember Nokia? Both of those companies were preeminent manufacturers, dominant suppliers of the cell phones that were mentioned in the introduction. Effectively, both of them are non-players today. Motorola lost its market share during a transition which was going from analog to digital cell phones. Nokia lost its market share position going from digital to smartphones. I would imagine I have a fair chance of coming back to you in five years from today and say, how many of you remember Apple? <laughs> and after that will be, how many of you remember Samsung? You hardly ever win market share in a field when you compete head on with an incumbent supplier unless there is a transition that takes place. Technological transition, analog to digital, digital to smart, something of that sort. How many of you remember a company called Digital Equipment Corporation? Vax Mini Computers. Do you have any mini computers here at Oak Ridge? What happened to Vax? Well, microprocessor came along, the PC came along, and mini computers went their way. DEC was a preeminent supplier of mini computers. They lost out because of a transition. How many of you remember Kodak? We went from film to digital capture of images. This applies to countries as well or societies. The United States was a great beneficiary of World War II. We exited World War II as the only developed country with a manufacturing base still intact. That was a transition. That transition allowed the U.S. to gain an unprecedented market share in the world's economy. And for 30 years or so, the U.S. was really unchallenged in that position by that, that change called World War II that took place. So, if you look today at transitions, I think the biggest economic transition the world has ever seen has occurred in the last one to two decades. And that transition was the end of the Cold War, the opening of Chinese and Indian marketplaces to capitalism, opening of Russia and the East Bloc to capitalism, the opening of South America and the Middle East to capitalism. Combine the population of those geographic areas is roughly three billion people. It's roughly half of the world. Almost overnight in economic terms, half of the world's population became capitalists. You have never seen an economic transition like that in the history of mankind where half of the population of the world all of a sudden switches from looking inwardly and looking at a socialist structure to a capitalist structure. The question I would just rhetorically ask then, this is the biggest economic transition we've ever seen. Would you expect that market shares would be won or lost associated with this transition? And unless you answer yes, they will be won and lost, you haven't thought about it long enough. The uh, third basic rule going forward is that your standard of living depends pretty much on your education level 
And I don't really have to stress that in an audience of this type. You're all working at Oak Ridge. You all have wonderful educations. Uh, you benefit from those educations because you're able to add value in the work that you do. Because you can add value, you get paid a lot of money. Societies in general do well if the average population member is well educated and can add value to what they do. So education is an absolutely important key here. The fourth rule is information and money flow relatively freely. Information with the internet flows incredibly freely anywhere in the world. Money flows preferentially to those areas where it gets the highest rate of return. There's not much restriction on where you can invest today, and people tend to invest where they get the highest rate of return. And if you have an idea, that idea can go just about anywhere in the world and be turned into a product, a service, or a company. And the last basic rule I want to stress is one that I think is obvious to everyone in this audience, which is 21st century is really the century of knowledge and innovation. It's not the century of natural resources. I don't think it's the century, century of service organizations. I think it's the century of innovation, technology, new product creation, new service creation, high-end service creation. So I have five basic rules that dictate competitiveness in the 21st century. And then you ask, and world leaders should be asking themselves, and leaders of the United States should be asking themselves, OK, if those are the five rules that I have to play by, and only the paranoid survive, what should I be doing? What levers should I be pulling to make sure that I'm going to be competitive in the 21st century? And it turns out there aren't a lot of levers that you can pull. One lever is clearly the education lever. Education is the key to everything. It's the key to adding value to what you do, and that, therefore it's the key to a strong economy. So I really need to pull the education lever and have the best educated workforce. That's how I can be baseline competitive. But what are the other levers? Well, it turns out another lever is investing in new ideas, research and development. The creation of new ideas via research and development creates new products, new services, new companies, new economic growth. So I can pull that R&D lever as well. And by the way, I'm, I'm talking here not just companies, not just does Intel hire the best and smartest people it can, does Intel invest a lot of money in R&D, but should countries be doing exactly the same thing? So what's the last lever, the third lever? And that one happens to be creating the right environment for smart people to get together with smart ideas and doing something. And that's the environment you have in your society. And it's such things as the rule of law, intellectual property protection, the availability of money to do new things, venture capital. It's the availability to hire the best and brightest people wherever they may reside. So it's all that environmental stuff that is usually the realm of the government to set those standards, those policies. But those are the only three levers you have to pull. Best education, invest in R&D, and the right environment. And if you just look at a, a very simple example, take the foundation of the integrated circuit industry. How did this start? Basic research at Bell Labs. Bell Labs, a lot of people don't think of it as a national laboratory, but it was clearly a national laboratory. It was funded by a public monopoly. <laughs> Taxpayer money went in. Great ideas came out, just like Oak Ridge. Some guys in the late 40s and early 50s kind of invented the transistor. Bardeen, Herring, Shockley, and those guys. They spun out that idea. Actually, Shockley even tried to do what you're trying to do today. Shockley moved from New Jersey to Stanford and created Shockley transistor to try to accommodate this. Turns out Bill was a much better scientist than he was a manager. Shockley transistor didn't do too well. But Shockley transistor spun off Fairchild. Fairchild spun off 
whole bunch of other companies, including Bob Noyce, Gordon Moore, Andy Grove, who left and formed Fairchild. Actually, Grove, or, uh, Shockley formed Fairchild, Fairchild spun off and formed Intel. Noyce, Grove, Moore came from Fairchild to form Intel. So you have idea out of a national laboratory, spun off into the proximity of some great research universities, Stanford and Berkeley, the presence of the right environment, venture capital. Arthur Rock, who was the first venture capitalist in the United States, started Intel, first venture capital company formed in the US. And the rest is kind of history. You went from the transistor to Bob Noyce and simultaneously uh, Jack Kilby at TI discovering the integrated circuit to Ted Hoff trying to do a electronic calculator creating the first microprocessor to the development of the personal computer to the development of today's internet and everybody's computational capability. No better example than smart people, a smart idea, and the right environment. So what do other countries do about this today? If you're sitting in Russia, or you're sitting in a Western European country, and you realize these things that I'm talking about, what are you doing today? And if you look at the strategies, there are a bunch of different strategies. Everybody in the world now recognizes that the Tier 1 research universities of the United States in conjunction with the national labs is a national treasure and is the ultimate vehicle to spin off smart people and smart ideas. The unique characteristic here is the association of these laboratories with industry to work on problems of some commercial significance quite often. This is a uniquely American characteristic, but everybody's trying to copy it. All the Western European universities are trying to copy this. You cannot go to a Chinese university and not find alliances with six U.S. universities trying to copy the U.S. curriculum research agenda and so forth. I happen to co-chair an effort in Russia called Skokovo, where the Russians are trying to replace their university and separate Russian Academy of Science laboratory structure with a tier one research university copied after MIT. The Middle East is trying to do this. King of Saudi Arabia writes a $10 billion check and says, is that enough for your initial endowment for a new technology university? It's not just in Saudi Arabia, you can go to the UAE, go to Qatar. Everyone is trying to do this. So a lot of effort to copy what the US is doing. The, um, there's also an observation that startups, venture capital is important. Countries who don't even have great universities or research agendas at all have recognized this. If you have an idea today, you want to pursue this, you can go to Chile, look up Startup Chile on the web, They'll write you a check for $50,000 as, as you relocate to Santiago and work on your idea in Chile. The Russians are trying to do this as part of their Skolkovo activity, create a venture capital community in Russia to commercialize the research which has historically come out of their research institutions. Russians have a few problems. First of all, there hasn't been the recognition of intellectual property in Russia. Commercialization does not a, appear in the Russian language. So no one ever took ideas and tried to put them in the marketplace. They did a great job putting them into the defense establishment in Russia or the space establishment, but not into the commercial marketplace. The Irish are trying to do this. Just about everybody is trying to do this. Chinese have high-tech parks. There are uh, think tanks and uh, organizations set up to simulate or stimulate taking technology in the marketplace. The favorite name I have one and I visited about a month ago in Finland, which is Startup Sauna, which in fact is a, the University of Alta there, which has a big startup activity where they have an incubator for startups, but they also have a sauna right in the middle of the whole establishment so you can go in and strip down and think. I don't know if you do that here at Oak Ridge. <laughs> um, and there are other strategies that countries are trying to do. The Koreans, I think very astutely, 
decades ago recognized the value of education. And they have gone from one of the lowest education level countries to one of the highest in terms of per capita education. And correspondingly, the GDP per capita in Korea has grown tremendously rapidly compared to all of the surrounding countries in Southeast Asia because of education. The Finns have done a similar thing in Finland. They just weren't paranoid enough about Nokia. <laughs> and a few countries have noticed that if you compare the R&D investment of your country to the percent of gross domestic product, those countries that tend to invest above three or four percent of gross domestic product into R&D inherently create more ideas and if you have the right environment can inherently have more startup activity. Israel has been an excellent example of this country that invests about five percent of GDP into R&D. Finland, similar. So you have lots of approaches to this change, the sea change in the economy. What about the U.S.? What has the U.S. got? The U.S. has the largest economy in the world for any country. It's not larger than Western Europe or the European Union, but it's larger than any country in the world by far. The U.S. invests more in R&D than any country in the world. The USD historically has had the best research universities. They're the envy of the world. The U.S. has more Nobel Prize winners than anybody in the world. We're okay. My only question here is, are all of those leading indicators or lagging indicators? And are all of those trending in the right direction for this 21st century competition? It's pretty easy to say that Nobel Prizes are typically lagging indicators and not leading indicators because the average time between getting a Nobel Prize and doing the work is 20 or 25 years, so still having the most Nobel Prizes annually doesn't mean much. But looking at the growth in R&D, looking at the changes in your education system, looking at the environment for investing in innovation, those are key things. So what's been happening in the United States? I am a member of the National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Sciences, which is really an umbrella organization as the NAS, the NAE, and the Institute of Medicine, the three national academies in the United States, it was formed under Abraham Lincoln. And it was formed to advise the government on issues of science in general. And what happens at those national academies is Basically, any member of Congress can come along and ask the National Academies their opinion on a topic. National Academies are supposed to be an independent body without any you know, specific business interests. Uh, they can advise the government in an unbiased fashion. Uh, one of the senators from this state, Lamar Alexander, basically was amongst a few other congressional leaders who asked the National Academy of Sciences in the early 2000s to say, hey, are we paranoid enough? Should we be worried about the future? And out of this came a report which was called Rising Above the Gathering Storm, published in 2005. And the 2005 Rising Above the Gathering Storm report said very simply uh, what I've said already. 21st century is a century of innovation technology. The three important things are education, investing in R&D, and having the right environment. And here are a bunch of suggestions for government policy. That was in 2005. By the way, nothing in that report was original to that report. It was really a compilation of existing observations, databases, trends that were taking place. We reconvened five years later in 2010 and said it's the, the group of authors of that report, and we said it's our job to update the suggestions we made to you, the government, five years ago. And we basically concluded in 2010 that the United States was in worse shape than it was in 2005 relative to the suggestions that were made. Effectively, nothing had been done on essentially any of them. 
the only thing that really kind of happened was that we had proposed that the Department of Energy, ARPA, create an energy-focused DARPA funding agency, and that happened, but none of the other suggestions went very far. So, where are we today? And let me just go through very quickly the three areas that I talked about, education, funding of R&D, and the right environment. And I'll try to lay out the suggestions that were made and what progress we've made or haven't made. And then we'll get to the end, I'll make a couple of suggestions. One of the suggestions is, you know, force every congressman to read the Rising Above the Gathering Storm Report and give them a test and they can't get elected unless they can pass the test on the contents, but uh, it's neither here nor there. Education. There are numerable studies on education in the United States, and education is really bimodal, as most of you know. There's a K-12 system, which is a state monopoly, and then there's a higher education system, university system, there are state universities, but the higher, energy, higher education system is a competitive marketplace compared to K-12, which is a state and local monopoly system. And I'll address each one of those separately. K-12, uh, essentially every international measure of K-12 education for an average kid in the United States shows that we're in the lower half of the OECD countries in the three topics that get measured, sometimes there are four, but in language arts, understanding your native language and being able to read and write with comprehension, mathematics, science, and sometimes problem solving is included as a recent measure of international competitiveness. Of the 32 or so OECD countries that take this test periodically, the U.S. typically ranks in the bottom third. We do okay in reading, we're just slightly below average. And every year, this report comes out, I'm amazed that it lasts for about a half a day in the news cycle and then we go back to normal things. And to give you one example, about a week ago in the New York Times, there was an article, the headline said, U.S. kids do well in international exam. And then if you read the text, it basically said, well, the U.S. kids are below average in reading, mathematics, and science. They are near average in problem solving. So the headline said, being near average in the OECD countries in problem solving is doing well. That's the media attitude towards this topic. Well, what, what goes on in K-12 education? There have been some interesting uh, recent documentaries on the topic. One which I would recommend is a documentary by a gentleman called Bob Compton. And what Bob did was to do something he entitled Four Million Minutes. Now, what is four million minutes? Turns out four million minutes is roughly how many minutes there are, or excuse me, two million minutes. Two million minutes is how many minutes there are in four years. And four years is how long it takes you to go through high school. So he chose to look at two kids from the Midwestern US, two kids in India, and two kids in China for their two million minutes of high school education. And when he looked at two kids in China, he looked at two kids in China, not in rural agricultural China, but in the big cities in China, where the education system works pretty well, in big cities in India. He concluded very simply at the end of the study, and it's shown in the documentary, that the U.S. kids excelled in one and only one area, and were deficient in all others. The one area they excelled in was self-esteem, and they trailed their counterparts in India and China in every topic of learning. A little bit of a wake-up call when you compare that with the PISA exams that show we are in the lower third of the OECD countries on a routine basis. Okay, so there have been other studies on K-12 education. In fact, you can go back to how many of you were alive when Sputnik went up? 1957, in early 1958 was the first seminal study on K-12 education in the United States called Pursuit of Excellence. 
John Gardner, who later became head of health and human services under the Johnson administration, authored that report. There was a report 25 years later called A Nation at Risk. Uh, that's where a gentleman by the name of Frank Harvey, who authored that report, trying to get some interest in, in the report, wrote the phrase that if a foreign nation had imposed upon the United States the mediocre K-12 education system that we have, we would well consider this an act of war. Uh, but the nation at risk basically said we have the same problem we had in 1958 when Pursuit of Excellence was published and gave the same set of recommendations to fix that. In 1992, the governors of the United States met the National Governors Association and said by the year 2000, our kids will be top in math and science in the world because we're kind of at the bottom now. 1999, John Glenn, the astronaut, chaired a report titled Before It's Too Late, which concluded the same thing that all the other reports had concluded. 2005, Rising Above the Gathering Storm concluded what the other people had concluded. 2008, the governors met again and concluded what they had failed miserably to be top in the nation, or top in the world in math and science, and vowed again to be there. 2011, President Obama said by 2020, we'll be top in math and science in the world. And then 2013, last year, the Council on Foreign Relations issued a report saying that education from a national security perspective is deadly important, not only because strong economic growth is important, but they concluded that roughly seven to eight out of 10 American youth were ineligible to serve in the armed forces for one of three reasons. They couldn't pass the physical exam, they were in jail, or they couldn't pass the test to get into the armed services. Basic skills of math and reading. Seven to eight out of 10 youth. Um, so you have a whole series of reports saying it's a technical term, K through 12 education on average sucks. There, there's, there are some, some very bright lights in this area, there are some very dull lights in this area. On average, the light bulb is barely lit. So we're below average across the world. What are the three things that everybody has concluded that you need to do to have a good education system that every one of those reports over 55 years has stated and nothing has happened? It says you need to have teachers who know content material and are treated like professionals and paid like professionals. You need to set high expectations in the schools and don't pass people if they don't meet those expectations. Oh, by the way, you need to have the input spec for universities identical to the output spec for K-12. Hasn't happened. And you need to have some tension in the system. Tension is called accountability. Accountability on the teacher administrator side, accountability on the student side. Every good education system in the world has those three things. The United States kind of fails in all three for the most part. So those suggestions basically get teachers who know the material, pay them and treat them like professionals, set high standards, have tension, are still as active today as suggestions as they were in 1958 when John Gardner first put them on paper. There was a study done in 25 years after A Nation at Risk. So it was done in 1983, 2008, there was an update, 25 years later. That report concluded the suggestions made in 1983 are just as important today, 2008, as they were 25 years earlier. Nothing has happened on any of those issues, not because Technically, they can't be done, but by, because of political reasons, the system was unwilling to accept and change, move in that direction. So we have a whole lot of work to do in K-12. And I'll even actually give you a few reasons in a moment to be positive in this area, but a whole lot of work to do there to get above average to be competitive. How about the university level? We have the world's best universities, right? When I graduated from Stanford, Stanford is, maybe all of you didn't graduate from Stanford, but Stanford's the best. 
<laughs> but is that a leading indicator or a lagging indicator? When I look at young engineering students going to, into our universities in their freshman year, how many of them make it out in engineering or the science field that they start in? Way less than half. We don't do a good job converting that energy and enthusiasm and interest in science and engineering into graduates. Everybody is copying our universities. And so are we paranoid about putting the best teaching methods into our universities? And Carl Wyman, Stanford professor now, Nobel Prize winner, done a lot of research on interactive learning at the university level, doing away with the standard lecture big audience format that we typically all experienced. And learning rates go up by a factor of two or three or five X in that format. But how many university professors are willing to give up their lecture format and go to a new system? Carl tried to get this introduced at Stanford. It was a faculty revolt. He had to go to the University of British Columbia. Last time I looked, the University of British Columbia is outside the United States. We get the faculty interested in this. Are we paranoid at Stanford? I contend no. And let me give you one factoid. You know, semiconductor guy, made computers, very interested in how fast your computers are. You've got Titan somewhere around here, which is a huge big thing. Doesn't have Intel inside, but that's okay. It's a big fast <laughs> computer. I, I rest knowing the fact that 80% of the world's top 500 supercomputers have Intel inside. You guys will get there eventually. <laughs> But interesting thing about fast computers is they need programming, and especially supercomputers and the parallelism and all that good stuff. So software stuff is very important. So how do you measure software capability? Well, Association of Computer Manufacturers, ACM, has an annual world series of software programming for basically 1,000 plus universities around the world and nearly 10,000 teams of software engineers at universities around the world. This is a contest that the United States used to win every year. Started in 1977, and the US won this contest every year until 1990. When a team from New Zealand won it, then the US won it a few more times. And I think the last time the United States won this award was in 1997. Do you know the top place team this last year? From the US? Carnegie Mellon placed 11th, not even in the top 10 in the world. Is that a leading indicator of what's happening? Is that something we should be paranoid about? and worried about. Why are the Russians, the Chinese, the Taiwanese, the Eastern Europeans winning this award all the time now, and we're not? So I accept we have great universities, but are they doing what's necessary to compete in the 21st century? Or are they resting on their laurels like the US is resting on its economic strength? We've always been number one. We'll always be number one. We don't have to do anything different. Let's switch to R&D. I'm a great fan of R&D just because the creation of new ideas changed the world. How many of you have heard of Microsoft? Microsoft is a big company. Microsoft is a little bit like Intel and IBM and other big companies. They invest eight, nine billion dollars a year in R&D. I mean, that is bigger than all the national labs put together, I believe. That's bigger than the NSF budget for physical sciences, I believe. One company. How could you compete against that company? Well, let's see how people have competed against Microsoft. I figure Microsoft has had 
three, maybe four challenges in their history, which have almost brought the company to their knees and forced the company to, on the fly, change its strategy in response. Where did those challenges come from? Did they come from IBM, SAP, Oracle? Where did they come from? The competitive marketplace? The answer is no. They all came from one or two researchers in a university with an idea. Mark Andreessen, browser, Illinois. Jerry Yang and company, internet directory, Stanford. The Google boys from Stanford. You could put, could put a couple of other things in here as well. Um, I could have put Linus Torvald, Linux in here as a kind of an individual idea and, and focus. The message is with an eight or $10 billion research budget, you can still be brought to your knees by one smart idea. And in fact, most corporations, smart ideas aren't usually considered very smart by the CFO. <laughs> the CFO always says, well, why do you want to go do that new thing? We can put this money into our existing product and get a little bit more margin out of it. But research universities, national labs, come up with smart ideas. So the research budget is important, and not so much the fact that Intel spends eight or nine billion dollars or Microsoft spends eight or nine million billion dollars, but because we as a country support basic research in our universities and our national labs, and that basic research spins off these bright ideas for the next generation. So are we increasing that expenditure at the rate we should? When we look around the world, the Chinese are dramatically increasing their budgets. The Europeans aren't doing a very good job, but at least they have a goal to get to 3% of GDP of the European Union in R&D. The Russians are trying to do something in that space. The other Southeast Asian countries increasing their budgets as well. Budget in the U.S. has been roughly flat at 2.5% of GDP. Unfortunately, that's been by the corporate sector picking up where the government sector has been letting off. The government sector also spends a heck of a lot of money on defense R&D, which has nothing to do with the sort of R&D I'm talking about, building big airplanes and tanks and missiles. Rising above the gathering storm basically took the chant of double the budget of the Department of Energy Basic Research and the National Science Foundation in the next few years. We made that suggestion in 2005. We haven't made much progress. The really sad thing is we took that chant from the 1990s. So folks, we're approaching two decades now of saying this is important. Not much has happened. Let me just briefly talk about the environment. There are a couple of things about the environment that could be done overnight. I believe it would help the U.S. in its competitive posture. One is an immigration law that makes sense, especially an immigration, illegal immigration law for people with advanced knowledge and training to let them in the U.S., especially those people that have been educated at U.S. universities at taxpayer expense that we now send home to work at home. The other thing is corporate tax policy. I'll give you one example of the disincentive associated with the high corporate tax rate in the United States and personal associated with the company that I used to work for, Intel. Intel builds $5 billion manufacturing facilities. If you compute the net present value of one of those facilities built in the United States with its labor rates, its tax rates, its infrastructure costs, compared to a facility built somewhere else in the world in a area where the corporate tax rate might be 10%, not 35%. The net present value is about a billion dollars different 
from a high tax environment to a low tax environment. And the great majority of that difference is tax rate. It has nothing to do with labor rates. So the tax rate in the United States disincentivizes the Intel CEO from citing that facility in the United States. If I were to do so, I'd have to go to my shareholders, if I was still CEO, and said, I made the decision to build this new facility in Oregon. It's going to cost you, the shareholders, a billion dollars. What do you think about that? The next time the proxy statement came out to elect me to the board and reappoint me as CEO, I know what would happen. <laughs> they would say, what are you, stupid? Tax policy could be changed overnight. Immigration policy could be changed overnight. These are not long-term infrastructure issues. They're rules and regulations that our Congress, our President, could act on. They're not happening. We still have some good infrastructure environment issues. We still have the best venture capital system in the world. They went a little bit sidetracked for the last 10 years and invested in a lot of green technology which unfortunately requires a government subsidy to get a return on investment. So the John Doors and the Odd Koshlas of the world went from being venture capitalists to being lobbyists in Washington to get subsidies on wind power, solar power, et cetera. I would have much preferred they'd use their energies to lobby for higher investment in R&D in this laboratory and others to create alternative energy systems which are economic rather than lobbying for subsidies. But we still have the best venture capital system in the world. We still have a, a society which applauds success. And in fact, one of the few societies in the face of the earth where if you participated in two or three failed startups, it's actually a positive experience. There are many, many countries where bankruptcy is a black mark for the rest of your life. The US, fortunately, doesn't have that. But we're not doing particularly well on education. We're not doing particularly well on R&D investment. We're not doing particularly well on the environment, things we could do immediately. So what's the future hold? All of you folks here know the hot topics of the future because every country in the world knows the hot topics of the future. And you're doing a lot of that work here, alternative energy, new materials, new IT and communications technology, the marriage of biology and engineering for biotech, the use of high-performance computers for simulation to get off the laboratory bench, and whether you're looking for cures for cancer or new materials, speeding up that technology phenomenon. Folks, there's no secret. I go to Russia, they have the same key technologies for the 21st century that the United States has, that Japan has, that China has, that Brazil has. There's no secrets in any of that area. So what do we need to do? Well, I think we need to really fix education. And you guys do a lot of work here. We all do a lot of work in education, especially STEM education around the US. Unfortunately, on the average, we're not making much progress. You do some great work here with the first robotics competition. I'd like you to lobby in Tennessee for what I'm lobbying on in Arizona. Why doesn't every high school in Tennessee have a robotics team? Why isn't it part of the interscholastic competition? Why do we continue to support schools of education who first and foremost focus on the pedagogy of teaching as opposed to supporting the programs like you teach that came out of the University of Texas to turn scientists and engineers into teachers without having to go through the mind-numbing experience of the school of education? Why don't we blow up undergraduate schools of education? That makes me a great fan of most schools of education, by the way, when I give that speech. I happen to run a charter school system in Arizona. We have two of the top five high schools in the United States. We have four or five of the top 10 in Arizona. We do not hire certified teachers. We're a charter school. We're not bound to do that. We do the strange thing of hiring physicists to teach physics, chemists to teach chemistry, mathematicians to teach mathematics, history majors to teach history, economics majors to teach economics. 
80% of our teachers are not certified. We get great results. Content expertise means something in the classroom. How can you teach mathematics if you don't love mathematics? How can you teach chemistry if you don't know chemistry? These are things where we have to collectively rise our voices. So, net-net, why am I here and not trading my U.S. passport in for a New Zealand passport? And I love New Zealand because I'm a fly fisherman and they have the best fly fishing in the world. Um, I'm optimistic still. And why am I optimistic? I want to go back to rule one that I gave you at the start of the talk. Rule one said, market shares are won and lost periods of transition. That means, if you look at the 21st century, with all of this cool stuff that's coming down, the biotech transition, the new materials, computer simulation experimentation, space, alternative energies, we still stand the chance, because those industries are in transition, of grabbing the leading market share and getting growth going. So if we do fix education, we do get paranoid at our universities, we do double the basic research budget, we've got a chance. And you've got to be optimistic about that chance because of the vast resources this country has. But I do think you have to be paranoid about this. If you're not, then you sit on your behind and you just let the system go as it's been going. We let our politicians engage in the economic solution to the United States is to raise the minimum wage. And how many of you think that will make the United States competitive in the 21st century? Anybody? So I'm optimistic because I've seen technologies, industries transform themselves. I've seen the semiconductor industry where we've made computing free, even though Titan costs a whole bunch of money. When you look at the cost per flop, it's pretty damn cheap. And even though you all have cell phones and you have to pay Verizon or AT&T, something for that communication infrastructure, communication is free. That's because you can push so many photons down a glass fiber faster than Moore's law. And free MIPS or free flops and free BODs made the internet happen. That transition can happen again. But it'll happen if, in fact, you've got the infrastructure to make it happen. If you've got the well-trained people and you're doing the research and you're at the leading edge. And importantly, you can foster the investment to do that technology in your country. You've got the tax rate right. You've got the immigration policy right. You've got the environmental rules and regulations right to make that happen. So I'm optimistic, only because change is inevitable, and it doesn't take much to make a paranoid optimistic. Thank you. Thank you so much for a very talk. For the folks who were not here, you missed a fantastic talk. So uh, please. So the format for this is it will be like a fireside chat. We'll take questions from the audience, and we have questions from the social media. Let me start by asking the first question. Um, January 21st, 2017, President Craig Barrett, you have a Letterman list of 10 things. What are those 10 things that you would do? Well, I'd make sure that the, the you've got to give me the House and the Senate too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot the Harry Potter magic wand. The other one is also available. No, I'd, I'd, I'd fix the environment stuff, which is, can be fixed basically by administrative fiat from Washington. I mean, you can pass a law changing the immigration policy overnight. You can pass a law changing the tax structure overnight if you've got Congress and, and the administration on the same side. I would, uh, I would frankly 
not have chosen the current policy of the, the current administration of investing all of my nickels into health care, I would have invested them into the competitive stuff that we've been talking about this morning. So I, I would also um, uh, put the, the government funding agencies that are funding basic science research, NIH, DOE, NSF, their budgets on a, a, an increased trajectory as a first and far, foremost part of the budget. You know, when I look at the, the uh, bills that go through the Congress on agriculture subsidies, on highways and things of that sort, and then I look at the magnitude we spend on basic research, it's a, research is a rounding error. Yeah. So it doesn't take a lot of money to fix this, but it takes a priority that's looking forward. And you all know the, the, the reason none of this happens is because as soon as you get elected, uh, your first and foremost goal is to get reelected, and to get reelected, you have to make the voters happy. And so, to make the voters happy, you have to do something for them in the short term. And unfortunately, the stuff you guys do here at Oak Ridge is not short-term stuff. It pays back in 10 years. You don't get reelected by telling your voters, "I just, you know, gave another billion dollars to Oak Ridge, and you'll see the benefits in 10 years." That might work in right here, but doesn't work in the rest of the country. Outlook, time outlook is way too short for most politicians. Yeah. But is there a way to separate it out? I mean, uh, are we reacting enough to the sense of paranoia? No, of course not. No. 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 Does anybody think the, no. the U.S. is taking seriously uh, yeah, the competition? Some. You know, what happens is, all of you who have been in some form of management and you want to change an organization, organizations always go through the stages of denial. I don't have to change, I'm okay. And then something happens and you're either forced to change or the situation gets so bad you decide to change. Uh, but you, the U.S. is in this denial period. And the first thing you do in a denial period is you blame everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and when you, we get through blaming everybody else for our problems, and then we'll get around to looking inwardly and we'll hopefully make the right changes. Questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Please stand up so we can see you. <laughs> All right. Hi. So my question is about suggested roles for development of technology transfer infrastructure between or from universities and national labs that would not only increase the amount of money flow to and from those research institutions, but also increase their value in the public's eyes. So I guess in summary, the question is, are we doing enough, the right things, for transferring knowledge into the marketplace? Um, you're never doing enough tech transfer uh, you know, Gatorade was the first great example of tech transfer. Mm -hmm. and it made the University of Florida rich. And since then, every university has, has created a technology transfer office to license their intellectual property and so forth. And I, I'm okay with that. The only time I haven't been okay with that is when Intel supported R&D at a university and then the university wanted to sell us back the R&D that we had paid for and collect a royalty on it. I did have a problem with that part of it. But we, we company and the industry supports a lot of R&D at universities. Um, tech transfer, I think the best thing you can do from a university standpoint is and a national lab standpoint, is have some facility to allow your professors and your students, your professionals, to basically engage in outside startups with an equity position yes. in those and to have some yes. skin in the game and get outside as quickly as possible. Um, also to, if they're not going to get involved in actually driving startups, to then make the, the uh, royalty rates associated with selling IP into the marketplace reasonable and, uh, and 
recognize that most of this stuff was created on the taxpayer dollars anyway, so why should the university generate huge returns on it? But there are lots of subtleties involved in that, but we can do a lot better job than we have in the past. And yes, to a degree, it would give the local public a much better view of those research institutions. All you have to do, is, though, is look at Silicon Valley, which is really Stanford and Berkeley and some venture capital money, created thousands of startups. Route 128 is really Harvard and MIT. Bingo. Created thousands of startups. It's pretty well recognized, and if you even publicize a little bit more, I think you could have a great sales pitch. This is what a great research university does for you. It is an economic engine, and it should be supported to the highest extent. So can we pursue that question? So this has been something that I'm obsessing with personally, a few of us in the lab as well, which is if you look at the Tennessee Valley area, it has a lot of the embodiments of Silicon Valley. It doesn't have Berkeley Stanford yet, but um, power, quite available, w water, highest density of PhDs in the country. So you have the intellectual part. So the question that's been on my mind, and we've been pushing this here in the last few years is, what does it take to make an area like this look like Silicon Valley? Well, it takes, I think you operate at a structural disadvantage if you don't have a great research university in proximity. No. Uh, because that's an attractor to people and it spins people off. You need to have a vibrant venture capital community that's going to fund these ideas. Knoxville is not high on my list when I think of vibrant venture capital centers in the United States. Um, you know, I live in Phoenix area. Phoenix is trying to do this. Yeah. Has a much bigger population. That's right. Yeah. You have, it has, you know, ASU is a pretty good university. It's growing in a research standpoint. But it's very tough to do this stuff in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. But you need to have this combination of spinning off people and ideas, a vibrant funding mechanism, to help that happen, and then the right environment to be able to yeah. get people to come and stay there and yeah. Comple participate. Completely agree. Completely agree. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, you, you <coughs> mentioned in, in one of the uh, uh, surveys of, of uh, the American students that the highest the only thing we excelled in was self-esteem. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, to what extent, uh, and, and if you have enough self-esteem, you don't have to improve, of course. So uh, I wonder to what extent, uh, as a country, and certainly politics, you see this, that, you know, uh, whether it's the right or the left, you have to say that we have, the U.S. is exceptional. But, you know, looking at it from the outside, not everybody thinks we are so exceptional. But does, does that self-esteem, maybe it's a, you know, it's a facade we build, is, is that sort of hurting us? Because like you said, all these things, is what we need to improve. You know, it's sort of like saying it's late, it's never been, never been this late before. Uh, you, know, the, you know, they all have the same message, but unless you have a catastrophe, it's where crisis driven, I guess, and then that's the problem. Yeah, the, the you know, the, the, the self-esteem issue reaches ridiculous limits when, for example, when states decide that you can no longer grade school papers with red ink because it's demeaning to the student. <laughs> well, come on. <laughs> or, and the, the school systems suffer because they typically are set up to accommodate the lowest common denominator and not the advanced students. So we've, we've kind of set up this education system which is, prides itself on being open to all but in the way it's structured, uh, doesn't accomplish the best result. And, and the system is much more input-oriented than it is output-oriented. It is how much money do you put in, how many kids per classroom, how much of this, how much of that. Nobody wants to focus on the results that come out the backside. And so in the process, we generate this self-esteem for our K-12 people, because they all get medals, they all get trophies, they all get their papers graded with green ink and not red ink and they all feel pretty good about that. Uh, I can tell you, uh, the company I work with, I worked at for 35 years, um, self-esteem was never high on anybody's 
agenda. <laughs> were we about to get our butt kicked by the competition or were we gonna kick the competition's butt? Yeah. Was high on the agenda. <laughs> and real measures were put in place. And communication up and down the entire structure of the company was in place so that every employee knew what we were doing, what the challenges were, what the competitive threat was, what we needed to accomplish. That's quite different than the education system and quite different from Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., as you point out, does belabor, is the U.S. an exceptional nation or not? Okay, you know, we were an exceptional nation. We were founded without a, you know, one dominant, uh, uh, set of folks. We were a bunch of immigrants who got together and, and did something. Uh, we were founded on a capitalist infrastructure and a democratic infrastructure. That's all great. But you've got to compete in the 21st century. And so what are the rules of competition? I read you my rules of competition. And we're not doing very well by those. So, some parts, I mean, I think some of the great corporations in the U.S. do a fantastic job of competing. But unfortunately, the system tells those corporations, you'd be better off by putting your capabilities outside the U.S. And let me give you a little bit of background on that. When I was at Intel, we did, uh, when I left, 75% of our business outside the United States. 75% of our business outside the United States. So were we dependent on the United States? The biggest single country market for Intel is China, it's not the U.S. So when you want the company to grow, you look at where your customers are, where the lowest cost of doing business, where the smart people are, increasingly. And I was quoted often as saying, you know, Intel, companies like Intel, could be very successful by never hiring another U.S. citizen. That's a scary thought, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm patriotic. I have kids and I have grandkids that live in the United States and I want them to have a great future. And when I say the system is kind of set up so that I don't have to hire another employee in the United States, that's penalizing my kids and my grandkids. That has to change. So a couple of questions uh, that I want to bring up to you. One is. Uh, um, you talked a lot about transitions, and so I want to I want you to explain to us a little bit more. Uh, the second one is, of course, us, the national labs. Are we positioned right? Are we doing the right things to impact the marketplace, given that our budgets can go up and down with on a women of fancy? Uh, what are your thoughts, for, perhaps, on the second question? Then we'll get back to transitions. Um. I have this simple picture of the research establishment in the U.S. I kind of tried to describe it. I think there are two legs to that stool. Uh, one is, well, there are three legs. I want it to be a stable <laughs> seat. Right. One is the private sector needs to invest in R&D, but it invests primarily in, in uh, near-term product development. Intel's $8 billion budget, a couple million, 100 million goes to basic R&D. The bulk of it goes to the next generation product. So that's one leg of the stool. Right. The research, peer reviewed research at the universities, it's a huge leg to that stool. And those are the individual investigators who are doing their projects. And that's a great, that is the de facto basic research establishment of the right. U.S. National labs are kind of associated with that because there are certain things you can do only in big facilities. You know, Stanford does not have a neutron source like you guys have here. Most universities don't have a Triton, Titan supercomputer. Uh, most facilities don't have a light source like Berkeley has or Slack has. You guys are the big science leg. The universities are the principal investigator legs, and companies are the applied R&D leg. Yeah. The thing that frightens me most, frankly, about 
you and the Department of Energy is I perceive there's a migration away from the big capital investment and moving more towards the PI approach. And you look more and more like a university. And as you look more and more like a university, I lose that big science leg and my stool topples over. So, you know, I, my thoughts are my own. Uh, they're not associated with my work with Berkeley and their advisory committee, but, you know, I'd love to see the DOE fund its big projects in a bigger hunks of money in a shorter time period. You know, why does it take 10 years to get the next gen light source constructed? It's only a billion and a half dollar project. You know, I'm used to building two $5 billion facilities from greenfield to operational and full production in 24 months. They're pretty complicated facilities, by the way. You know, they handle 12 inch wafers, they print circuits down to 15 nanometers. You gotta have billions of transistors in every circuit that work. The market judges you every day whether you're efficient or not. But we can do that in 24 months, so why does it take you guys this long to build your stuff? And I know all the reasons it does, because you, you get handed small checks, and you get a lot of supervision to help you do your job. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if, if I were president for a day, I'd, um, not only would I blow up the schools of education, but I might take a little bit of that supervision from the Department of Energy out of the way, too. So let's, let's get back to a big question. Did you, you, you had it on several occasions, transitions. And I want to tie it back to a transition that we talked about yesterday at dinner, Intel's transition. So can you pre-see a transition happening? How do you, in our business, we're condensed matter people, we can look for susceptibilities and look for a phase transition. How do you see transitions happening and how do you in some sense, if you're that good, you would drive the transition. You create and drive the transition. But at least you should manage a transition. Well, you know, when you look at Kodak, what was, the, what was Kodak? Kodak was a paper manufacturer masquerading as a image capture. Mm -hmm. Their basic business was image capture, but they were basically a paper manufacturer. Did they see the... Uh, digital camera coming? No, yeah, well, they did. But they were making so much money off of film and paper mm -hmm. that they wanted at all costs to preserve that cash flow structure coming mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. rather than being disruptive and eating their own business. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be willing to be cannibalistic and eat your own children. And that's how you make a transition happen. Uh, we used to joke at Intel, it really wasn't a joke, it was real life that uh, we were following Moore's Law, and if you looked at the revenue coming into the company over a 12 month period, and you looked in December compared to January, 90% of the revenue that came into the company in December came from products that weren't there in January. And that's because if you weren't doing that, you wouldn't be following Moore's Law. You would be milking your existing products. That's, well, it's so simple. And, and by the way, every financial analyst I've ever met says exactly the same thing. Craig, you know, if you just slowed down your technology machine a little <laughs> bit, you wouldn't have to build as many new factories. You wouldn't have to spend as much in R&D and you could just milk the existing products and think of what the P&L would look like for 12 months. It would be fantastic. And then you ask them, what would the P&L look like 24 months from now? And you'd be out of business. So you have to be willing to eat your own children before the competition does. And that is not an easy thing to do when you're in that three month earning cycle. And right. But you know, fortunately, we had Gordon Moore, and Gordon published that law. And then, you know, we deny that when I was there, we denied that Moore's law would ever end. <laughs> we, it was declared dead a dozen times, but 
we said, hey, smart engineers will solve these problems. You give them the best tools, you give them enough resources, enough research money, and they've kept Moore's Law going for 50 years. So Intel is not worried, paranoid about Moore's Law? Intel know? is paranoid because in the next breath, what are you spending some of your research dollars on? It's okay, are we gonna go to quantum computing? Or are we gonna go to photonic computing? Yeah. You know, one of the things I didn't mention uh, about excitement of the future is one of the ways you carry Moore's Law on is, is going to three-dimensional structures yeah. and also the incorporation of silicon photonics mm -hmm. with silicon electronics. And that is a huge transition. Mm -hmm. And they're putting a lot of money into that space. Two more questions and then. So, so, so you mentioned that this century is about innovation. And if you talk about global economic competitiveness, that translates to intellectual property, tra trade secrets, and the like, right? So um, I would argue that a very significant amount of innovation occurs in research beyond the pre-competitive stage research. So shouldn't the United States have a, have a policy of investing significant amounts of money and resources over the long term on applied research because that's where those uh, uh, innovations beyond the pre-competitive stage would occur. Uh, in fact, many of the new countries which are becoming economic players, are they're doing just that. They're investing primarily in that space. Well, you've got... The third leg of this stool is, in fact, the industrial investment in applied R&D. And I, I think that I'd like to see that leg of the stool basically stay in the private sector. They are closer to the marketplace. They know what makes sense from a customer standpoint. And I think they do a better job at that. And I, 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 I kind of shiver every time I, I, I get a message from the government when I was at Intel, we're here to help you with your applied R&D. <laughs> I said, come on, I'm spending eight billion bucks in there. What are you gonna do to help me? And my whole life depends on it, so I'm paranoid about that topic, go away. I think there's enough venture capital to take new ideas. And by the way, venture capital is not all out with just rich people their funds. Uh, Intel is the biggest high-tech venture capital company in the world. So there's internal venture capital money as well as external venture capital money. I think there's enough venture capital money and enough uh, muscle in the private sector to take care of that part. I just assume that, that the universities work on problems of significance associated with industry in that respect, but don't worry so much about taking it into the marketplace. Danny had his hand. The investment you talked about, if you were president for a day, you would double the, the science budgets. But sometimes when that happens, when you push money into those systems, you can see unforeseen consequences. NIH has had its budget doubled, and the success rate for people who are investigators has gone down over that time period because it's probably drawn too many people into the marketplace. And so uh, sometimes when you just force a lot of money into a system, you don't necessarily get the consequences that you want. Um, so what, what fraction of that R&D budget really is what drives the innovation? And uh, do you believe that you simply have to increase the numbers so that you get lucky? Or is there ways to be strategic and smart in the way you focus that, that growth in those R&D budgets? Well, th there's no question that being smart uh, increases your opportunity to be lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, there, there's a, in fact, you know, lucky comes in the dictionary before smart, and that comes in the dictionary before work. So there's all sorts of things you have to do. Uh, NIH, unfortunately, was incredibly successful where the physical sciences were not in increasing its budget, but it increased its budget driven on an emotional promise. We're gonna cure cancer, and we're gonna cure cancer by throwing money at it. Mm -hmm. 
and the NIH budget went up by what threefold over a decade or something like that. And the system was unable to absorb that increase and I think still do smart research. So we've always been very, uh, I think, judicious in our choices of, of, first of all, I want strong peer review on the basis of research. I don't want central bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. deciding what to do. And I want, give me a 15 percent increase per year. I think I can accept that and tolerate that in the growth of physical science research. So I don't want to, you know, double it overnight, but I want to double it on a or careful, self-absorbing basis. But I would uh, concur with you that the NIH budget increase, which was driven solely on emotion of this Cure Cancer campaign, uh, got too much money too fast. You know, the other thing uh, you can point to is how did the Russians compete with the U.S. for years when they didn't have the capability that the U.S. had in hardware? I mean, I, I spent a, a lot of time getting messages from the CIA. Could we tell them how many personal computers were in Russia and, and how this copy of an Intel 8286 got manufactured in Russia and things of that sort. But, you know, the Russians had essentially no compute capacity while they were competing in the Cold War against the United States. But they still competed with us on the basis of algorithms and smart scientists and engineers without that big resource. I just don't want to starve the U.S. resources. I want to intelligently increase them. And, and I also want to make sure that there's, you know, 10 or 20 percent of those research dollars are going into wild ass ideas off the mainstream and, and not just have the herd mentality of everybody's going to follow the same approach. But there ought to be sufficient funding to, to just off the mainstream go after new ideas, do new things. One last question. I know your room is itching. So I think, I think that everybody in this room uh, believes that this is a just cause. But you also indicated numerous times during your lecture that the elements of the problem and even to a certain extent aspects of the solution have been discussed for 60 years. So as a, as a flag bearer for this cause, what do you do differently to change the outcome? Because the outcome still continues to progress in an unfavorable direction. What do you do differently? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm optimistic on the following. If I look at K-12 education, for example, I am not optimistic about changing the existing K-12 structure. I'm very optimistic about alternatives to the K-12 structure, charter schools that can operate independent of the bureaucracy and the rules of the existing structure. If you look in the United States at the top high schools, there are one of two categories. They're either charter schools or they're magnet schools like Thomas Jefferson, which have admission requirements to get in. So it's not a, it's not a, a uh, open enrollment school. It's a, like a university. Charter schools, I think, provide enough competition to force the public schools to change when you get to a critical mass. So. Right now, there are only about 80 percent of the states have charter school laws. Or eight or ten states don't even allow charter schools. And most schools have restrictive laws. You've seen what's going on in New York City with the Basio and his war on charter schools and things like that. We need to nurture that alternative form of education to put enough back pressure on the public schools to change. And enough of that is happening that I'm optimistic. Universities are already not a monopoly. They are capitalist in their nature. They compete for professors, students, research dollars. I'm just hoping they're paranoid enough to watch what's happening around the rest of the world now that they have to continue to compete. Uh, on the environment side, after 20 years of talking, the topic of corporate tax rate is at least being discussed in Washington, D.C. Before, you could not even raise that topic without the eyelids closing in D.C. as a non-starter. Immigration policy is being discussed. If we'd ever separate legal immigration from illegal immigration, it could be done in a heartbeat. But the politicians, 
on one side or the other won't let that separation to solve the problem. They want a total immigration reform, but at least we're talking about that. And we're talking about increase in R&D budgets. It's the federal deficit, the deficit of the United States is a problem. I mean, $17 trillion in debt, how much more money can you throw at it? Can you prioritize research above asphalt? No brainer, but can you prioritize research above asphalt? Maybe we'll get a president, maybe we'll get some congressional leaders that can make that prioritization. <laughs> hey, I, I've been arguing this stuff in Washington for 25 years. Uh, my head is flat from running into the brick walls. <laughs> but I'm still optimistic, so don't get pessimistic on me. <laughs> <laughs> and we shall leave on an optimistic note that we still stand to fight the battle in the coming years. On that note, let's join in, in thanking uh, Craig for a very provocative talk. We wanted to give you a different kind of a single crystal, not silicon. But that's a, a, a note of gratitude from all of us. Thank well, you so thank much. Thank you very for much. Us. And let me just uh, close off comment. Uh, I've tried to say several times, I want to say it one more time. Uh, <laughs> Oak Ridge, Berkeley, Slack, Argonne, et cetera, are really a critical piece of this solution. You really are. Uh, the universities are a critical piece of this solution. And the private sector as well. We, and we do have to work together to make this happen. And we have to collectively raise our voices enough so our elected representatives in Washington are really doing the right thing for us. And that happens by the individual ballot, the individual vote, calling, writing your congressman, kicking them in the butt occasionally. Uh, i just give you one example of what I do. I, I get hit up by election season. Everybody calls you, they want money. And I have a very simple question that I ask people these days. Common Core, which is raising standards in public education. Our standards are way too low, they need to be increased. I ask every candidate, it's a very simple question. Are you in favor of Common Core? Raising standards in public education. And then they, if they hesitate, and don't say yes, but they give me their talking points. This is a federal takeover of local education. This is a conspiracy of the United Nations and Bill Gates and Arne Duncan <laughs> to stick their nose under the tent and, and take away local school board control. I, I then tell them uh, one of two things. If they believe that stuff, they're so biased, they shouldn't be elected to Congress. <laughs> and if they're not man enough or woman enough to stand up for what's right, they don't belong in Congress, and therefore I hang up the phone. If more people did that, they'd get the message. Uh, but that's the sort of thing you have to do to get to them and influence your votes in, in that positive direction. Anyway, political stuff is horrible. <laughs> I hated dealing with it, but it's a part of life. Yeah, thank you so right, much. Thank you again. Yeah.